Hi, my name is Ted Maris, and I'm a respiratory physician from the Uni University of Toronto in Canada. I have a major interest in non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease, and I'm here with my colleague and good friend, Dr. David Griffith, who's a distinguished professor from the University of Texas. And I think I'm the one who has the good fortune to uh, pick your brain a little bit as, as, uh, as the expert's expert in this area. Well, uh, that's very flattering, Ted, but <laughs> not true. <laughs> so I think that we all recognize, our colleagues all recognize, that this is a very difficult disease to manage. Yeah, the treatment is challenging. People require multiple drugs for very long periods of time. And despite our best efforts, the outcomes aren't always what we would like them to be. Oh, absolutely. Our armamentarium for treating these diseases is very limited, there's no doubt. Probably the single most frustrating aspect of managing these patients is our limited choices of, of antimicrobials. Given that issue and given some of the recent um, new research that we've seen presented, can you tell me a little bit about what you think uh, are some important uh, new findings in the treatment of, of MAC lung disease, mycobacterium avium lung disease? Yes, and I think there's actually some very exciting new data that's being presented. Uh, as you know, uh, a, a major limitation of, of our ability to, uh, to have an evidence base for, for treating our patients is the lack of studies in the past that have been either placebo-controlled or, or randomized controlled trials. Most of what we do with MAC disease uh, is based on, uh, on case series, on large numbers of patients who have received uh, certain medications. And I think there's great value in that, but you know, it's, also, it's also quite a limitation, and it, and it leaves open our practices to, I think, justifiable criticism. Well, um, in contradistinction, it, the, there has been uh, a recent large trial of an inhaled liposomal preparation of amikacin for treatment refractory MAC disease. It is a trial that, <clears throat> uh, though not placebo controlled, uh, was uh, uh, randomized between patients who received the liposomal amikacin preparation plus standard therapy and those patients with standard therapy alone. And uh, as you know, uh, that is a very difficult population of patients uh, to treat. Uh, this was a phase three study, um, and the results of that show, study show significantly better conversion of sputum to negative in the group receiving the inhaled liposomal amikacin preparation in addition to uh, standard therapy uh, at six months. Um, the, one of the most impressive things about that is that this data is very consistent with the phase two data that was done in a similar placebo-controlled trial with the same drug in the same population. Can you comment on the patients that were included in the study? Are these all comers, mild, moderate, severe? Um, tell us about those patients. No, that's extremely important. Um, they, these were patients who had been treated for at least six months uh, with multiple different medication regimens, usually uh, those that are based on guidelines, and had failed to have sputum conversion on those regimens. And, and actually there's a little bit of, uh, uh, that's a little bit misleading because most of these patients had many more than six months of therapy. I, you know, just as an aside, I think one of the real interesting uh, results of this trial was very consistent uh, data on sputum conversion in the control group, either the placebo group or the group that had only standard therapy, right at 9 or 10 percent, mm -hmm. which I think tells us a lot. That tells us that when we have this, this group of patients and we continue our uh, rather frustrating therapy, about the best we're going to do is maybe sputum conversion in 1 out of 10. But just as consistent, and I think just as important, from the phase 2 and the phase 3 trial, the sputum conversion rate was at 30% in those patients who received the inhaled liposomal amikacin. And, and you know, uh, just to put the, these results in context, there has never been a drug 
that has been FDA approved for treatment of MAC lung disease. Everything we do, as you know, is off-label. Um, and I think there is an extremely good chance that not only has this drug been tested in randomized controlled trials, two, with consistently good results, but it will be probably the first drug that the FDA approves for treatment of uh, MAC, MAC lung disease. That, that's obviously really exciting for me, for you, for our colleagues who deal with this disease, for our patients. Um, an increase from about 9% up, 9 or 10% up to close to 30%, that's pretty amazing, pretty substantial. Um, so we will hopefully have another drug in an armamentarium that will work. Can we talk for a couple of minutes about how we do following guidelines to put drugs together and and how we should how we should manage these patients? You've done some work previously, looking at how well physicians do or don't follow guidelines. Yes, and the, they don't follow guidelines. Is the bottom line. Um, it's a it's a very significant problem and. It, it's interesting that it's not just you know confined to the United States, but there is consistent lack of adherence to guidelines uh, around the world uh, in Western Europe, in Japan, and South Korea. Uh, and actually, I understand that you you have some interesting data uh, also that you've presented. That's right. That's right. We just presented uh, population-based data from Ontario, where we were able to look at everyone in the province who had MAC lung disease and access prescription data for all of those patients. And we found the adherence to guidelines with uh, receipt of standard three-drug therapy, macrolides, ambital, rifampin, was a bit better in, than in the previous studies, but still it was a minority. About 47% of patients treated that way. So not bad, it was better than other studies. The disappointing news, however, is that we saw 20% receiving macrolide monotherapy, and we saw another 17% who got other combinations like macrolides and fluoroquinolones, macrolides and rifampin, that will put patients, our patients, at high risk of macrolide resistance. Well, Ted, that, that is extraordinarily uh, bad news, uh, very depressing, uh, particularly since the, you know, the initial study you, that, that uh, we, I was involved in you talked about was done several years ago. And the, the idea that in that time there's been no progress is, uh, is, is very bad news. So, as a community, we have, we're not doing well enough in, in uh, treating our patients in the best way and uh, c communicating amongst ourselves in this field. Absolutely. I, I don't think it's a panacea, but clearly uh, outcomes would be improved if there was some better adherence to these guidelines, imperfect as they are. Absolutely. What about any other new agents? There, was, there were some data on an, another repurposed, if you will, new drug from TB, but repurposed as, as young as it is for non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Yes, uh, the drug is bedaquiline, uh, which was developed for treating drug-resistant tuberculosis, uh, and it's quite effective in that role. It also has excellent in vitro activity against MAC. And uh, the, the problem is it's extraordinarily expensive. And um, we have not been able to find funding for a large trial. We have only been able to obtain the drug um, on an irregular basis through, through insurance coverage. It is that expensive. Uh, but uh, it does show a glimmer of hope, um, as with most of these other agents. Uh, we're not talking about magic bullets, but it, 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 there is enough signal there that would certainly justify uh, a trial if we could get it, if, find funding for such a trial. So that, that sounds like we're working towards more studies to try and figure out appropriate combinations of medications. Yes. The best way to use them to have better e efficacy and uh, avoid resistance developing and then drafting some guidelines that hopefully we can, uh, we can share with our colleagues and that will be useful to the community and... and uh... Well, I might add one other thing. I mean, one potentially very good outcome 
if the FDA does approve the inhaled liposomal preparation is that other companies will see that there is a market for these drugs and that there is a way forward through the FDA. That's an exciting time to see some, yes. some developments in this field. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you about this uh, topic today, Dave. Well, it was my pleasure, Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.